Are you ready to get started? Yeah. All right. So my first question for you is, how did you actually get your start in acting? Oh, oh, we're going to take it way back. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's, 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 it's funny because I could answer it a couple ways. I mean, when I was in elementary school, it was really clear that, that the artist was there. Not like, not that I recognized it, but you know, I would bring these like plays that I, they, they were plays for children. And during recess, I would try to like cast my friends to like basically do play readings. I didn't know that's what I was doing. Um, and then through junior high, instead of handing in essays, I would ask for special permission to shoot movies or again, put these plays up to show my understanding of whatever the topic was. Um, and I would, I would, I would, they would say yes. You know, there, there are tapes somewhere floating out there of grade eight Olivia doing these really bad, but probably like so bad it's good kind of like movies out there. But I guess professionally, um, I, I, I actually went through like a lot of like scam agencies, but through that, it eventually led me to being um, an extra on um, sets that came to Edmonton. So we had a lot of what we call MOWs, Movie of the Weeks. Like once a year, some American Movie of the Week would come to Edmonton to film some Christmas movie. And uh, I would be an extra on it. And sometimes they would give me a few lines. Um, and then sort of being in that circle um, eventually led me to Broken Trail, which was AMC's first original programming attempt before they hit really big with Mad Men. Um, and so it was really, I think, Broken Trail that had the acting bug bite me full on, like just, you know, like I, I couldn't deny it because to take Broken Trail, I had to leave my life as I knew it. I was a, actually a broadcast journalist at the time for global television and, you know, um, a print journalist for Ken West Publications, which I think has now folded. Um, but, you know, I had to, I, I had to quit to take it. And, you know, even my own news directors were like, you gotta, you gotta take this. Like, we'll be here if you want to be back, but I don't think your heart's here. Like, this is a once in a lifetime. Go, go you know, and I've never gone back since, so. Wow. Well, with your background as a journalist, I noticed you worked for Entertainment Tonight Canada. Um, how do you feel like your background as a broadcast journalist prepared you for acting? It actually really shot me in the foot. I think a lot of people think that being a broadcast journalist somehow made the transition to acting easier, and that was not the case because they are two such different skill sets. You can't even say it's apples and oranges because it's not even, they're not even both fruit. Like, like broadcast journalism, I think, I think how it did prepare me is more for things like this, where you know, I'm really used to speaking, um, but in terms of the actual craft of acting, it took a lot of undoing because as a broadcast journalist, especially as someone who's like, you know, so sensitive and empathic, for me, I really had to learn to shut down a lot because you know, I would, arrive on scenes where most of the time when you're meeting someone as a broadcast journalist, it is not a good day for them. You know, they've just lost a loved one. Um, there's just been a terrible accident. And sometimes you're cold knocking on a door to ask for a photo of someone they just lost, you know, or you're attending a funeral for someone you don't even know and trying to ask people to give you a clip. And um, I think for me, I remember the day that I was like, I don't think I can do this anymore. And it was a girl who was just a couple years younger than me and she'd been, I'm getting a little off track here, um, but she'd been, you know, um, sexually assaulted, beaten and left to die in a trucking yard. And it took about three, four days before her body was found. So she was frozen solid and the police had to erect a heat tent around her to melt her body because if they just pulled her up, they were scared they would break her. And I just remember standing there you know, and everyone around me, like the crowd around me, it was just like, they were just drinking. It was just like, there wasn't a human being that, you know, was lying there. And, um, but to do my job, you know, I pushed down, I think the natural feelings that a human being should have when they see another human being who has endured and not survived such violence. 
And so when I went into acting, all of that skill I had built pushing down had to be undone. And, you know, so not only was there that, but also just being from, you know, a conservative Asian family, there's also a lot that has to sort of be undone so that emotion can come up and that emotional life can live and you can connect with your opinions and you can transfer that understanding. And then also I was so used to picking up words on the page as a journalist. So, you know, there's a certain cadence that journalists are famous for because we're trying to communicate, you know, points to you and I couldn't walk and talk as an actor and be like a normal human being and just say a line and not sound like a journalist. So um, I would say journalism did not prepare me for acting. Um, it, 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 it took a lot of undoing of journalism to become, you know, a, 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 a decent actor. Right. And with this show, there's a lot of emotion going on with all of the characters and working with one another. What was your preparation process and how did you build your character with the second season? Uh, um, I think for the second season, something we all noticed was how much easier it was for us to slide into our character's skins. First season, I didn't really feel what I call the spine of Atoy until episode four, where she has her first confrontation with Big Bill. And it was that scene where, you know, the director had me play very opposite the lines and play this kind of like, What's, what's going on? That I started to understand who Atoy was. So for second season to prepare for Atoy, I think it was just, I don't know how to quantify something like that. I, I think it's just, you know, you just, you've just, you just allow yourself to live in their thought process more. So that's where I'm very thankful to, to um, our amazing production designers and costume designers because all of that helps. You know, when you walk onto a set and you walk into a world that's been prepared for you, it's so much easier to slide into their thoughts and to slide into their skin. Especially with someone like Atoy where, you know, there's such stillness with her. There is so much mask work with her that it's all those subtle little mathematical calculations of like when you turn your head, when you blink, you know, when you um, just slide your eyes over to look. Um, but for that to have life and not just be technical, um, you have to really, I think, understand what she would be thinking in that moment and just trust that the camera and the DOP is gonna like catch you when you throw those little thoughts out and find those thoughts on camera, and then for the editors to find those thoughts and tell that story. And with the story of Warrior, this actually originally came from the idea and concept of Bruce Lee, and it's executive produced by his daughter, Shannon. How do you feel like the original concept has evolved from Bruce Lee's writing to what the show is today? Um, we never, we, you know, on our very, very first day as a cast doing a table read, Shannon was so thoughtful in that she prepared um, a beautiful letter from her and she included some original drawings that her father had done around the concept. I could like run back there and grab them and show you. Um, and it included some of his handwritten notes about how he named the character Assam. Um, so other than that, we didn't get to see a lot of his original, uh, apparently eight page concept but I know that Jonathan Tropper and Justin Lin um, and Shannon were very, very, very mindful about sticking to the integrity of what Bruce Lee was trying to communicate. Um, I hope we've done a good job, but I will say that as I've gotten to know Bruce Lee, the philosopher, and Bruce Lee, the, you know, anti-racist, multiracial coalition, you know, um, activist that he was, who I think came to understand that his presence on screen would be the biggest protest of all. I think that that spirit has definitely been carried into our version of Warrior for him, because I feel like in a way, this entire second season is a protest in itself, especially 
given what's going on in the world right now. You know, like um, with the uptick in xenophobia, with certain political figures um, scapegoating the Chinese very blatantly, um, with the greater picture of Black Lives Matter and the entire questions around racial reckoning, I'm really starting to understand that, you know, in a system like Hollywood where marginalized voices are um, not feeling represented that our very faces on screen is a protest itself, you know? Um, and I think, I think to me, that's the, 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 one of the most biggest through lines to, I think the spirit that Bruce Lee embodied and with the show, a lot of the conversations and vocabulary we're seeing on screen, um, without giving any spoilers, are happening right now, today, in our country, like you said previously. Um, what conversations do you hope or dialogue can be had after watching the show? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, I would love for people to... Um, I would love for Asians and, and non-Asians alike who maybe weren't as familiar with Asian American history to ask questions and do a little more deep exploration because what is really frightening and a weird kind of divine timing is if you look at the themes of our show, you really can see how something that is said in 1878 is oddly mirroring what's happening right now in 2020. So if we understand that the racist playbook has not changed, that maybe it will inspire activists, maybe it will inspire the everyday person, maybe it will inspire a viewer to innovate, um, to innovate some solution or their personal contribution to um, what's happening right now. And I think that's what Bruce Lee was all about. He was all about innovating. And because of that, he was so ahead of his time. And with the show, we also have not just Asian representation, but we also get to see powerful women on screen. Um, how do you hope this show can challenge stereotypes? You know, Shannon Lee and I had a conversation in Los Angeles um, last year, and we were really talking about her hope around um, how do you portray the strength of women and not a male idea of what a strong woman, woman is, um, but what the, what, how women are, 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 are truly strong in their own unique and different ways um, um, than men. And maybe if we break it down even more into male principle and female principle, which of course exists in every person regardless of their actual biological gender, it's like, I think what I love about season two is you see allyship between women. And I think that is one of the greatest strengths that women have is that we all understand what it is to um, be a mother, be a sister, be a daughter. And I think that kind of love transcends cultural boundaries. And I think our show, you know, in season two shows that kind of um, strength that is, that has been very common and sort of erased in a way from a lot of history. I mean, now you're seeing, you know, women, freedom fighters, their stories are, are re-emerging. Um, and I, I hope our show maybe gets people to think about that, um, that allyship between women is something that's so important. And, and in fact, throughout her story um, has been what's made some incredible changes and, and moved the needle forward. Right. And with the increase of representation and visibility with this show, um, what does diversity and representation mean for you? Hmm. It's an interesting question, right? Because it's almost become like this term that is thrown around so much that sometimes I feel like it's really lost its meaning 
especially as I feel like I'm seeing, you know, like performative actions on behalf of, you know, some institutions and networks where they're just sort of checking boxes um, for the veneer, mm -hmm. but they're still, um, you know, deep systemic things that um, are raising eyebrows for the communities affected. Um, so, Diversity and representation, you know, it's, 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 it's funny. I think I'll say that it's a, it's, a, it's a term that maybe I've lost a little bit of faith in, you know, um, because it's been thrown around in a non-deep dive kind of way. Um, so I think what it represents to me in this moment, and I would love for it to change to something more optimistic, is I think it now represents um, a concept that I question how much it's truly, truly being acted on and how deep that change that it's meant to represent and the voices that it is meant to give a megaphone to, um, how authentically um, it's actually happening. And how do you propose that we have authentic levels of diversity representation, especially in Hollywood? It's a question I've been asked and have been asking myself a lot. So um, I think one of the most simple things is consultants, you know, in the writer's room. I think that just is so common sense, you know, and, 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 and look, like, I do not want I think it's so easy to be to be like, oh, it's a it's a white male writer, so he shouldn't be writing for anybody, and, and that's way too simplistic, you know, because it's like there's a show I'm developing where I have indigenous characters, South Asian characters, even other Asian characters who are Southeast Asian. So you know, Filipinos and Cambodians, their culture is very different from mine as a as a as a as a Chinese person. Um, so, you know, by that same token, I should not be trying to represent them because I'm not of their culture. Um, but I think I'm very, I really want, because I, I, I see South Asian actors being scared that they won't pass as East Asian, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so I want them to have the opportunity to play their own culture, but that means that I'm going to have to ask them for help to be like, is this true? Is this authentic? Are we doing it right? Um, so I think conversations and a willingness to be uncomfortable um, and a willingness to ask questions and be corrected. And I think correcting people lovingly as much as possible. Um, and, um, you know, taking some hits on the chin uh, if you get it wrong, you know? Um, and I think re-examining um, those positions of power and, and, and um, yeah, who's represented at the top? Because it's true, it, it, a lot of change happens from the top down. Um, with the show being a period piece, how do you feel like it differs from your traditional period piece? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I think it differs because when I think of period piece, I think of stuffy people in corsets, bonnets, um, and you know they speak in an accent, and uh, I mean, we speak in accents too. But there is nothing stuffy or traditional about how we bring history to life. Not only with how we play with um, the different languages uh, on our show and representing whether we're speaking, um, you know, in broken English to people who don't speak Cantonese to when we speak perfect American English to represent that this is what we sound like to each other to when we actually jump into um, you know, Cantonese or our best attempts at it. Um, and, you know, there's so much humor in this and there's so much pathos and there's such um, contradicting and flawed um, psychological portraits that uh, it's, it's so entertaining and it's so high octane that this is not your traditional period piece. Well, thank you so much, Olivia. It was so great interviewing you. Thank you. Thanks for some great questions.